Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to this very special LANCAT uh, chat, <laughs> otherwise known as Home Games uh, with the one and only Tom McPhail. Hi Tom, how are you? Hi Nestle, I'm really well, thank you. Thank you for having me. No worries. <laughs> it, it wasn't It wasn't a hard one to organise, uh, <laughs> like with external guests, so yeah. we're going to try and stop this from just being a kind of uh, LANCAT team chat, so we're going to make sure that um try and encourage you all to ask as many questions of tom as you can because that means i ha don't have to ask my questions um so that would be good um and tom's just recently back from i can't really call it a jaunt it was more like i don't even know what to call it scaling mountains in spain so we're going to kind of talk about that um towards the end as well when why you were there and and your involvement with um the project and all of that yeah, kind of stuff cool, cool. um so I think people kind of know who you are. So I'll try and keep the introductions and housekeeping pretty brief. Um, we've got lots of people on today, so they obviously want to um, pick your brains and ask you loads of questions. So that's good. So 45 minutes should fly by. Um, so I think um, most people are familiar with this now, um, but it's quite self-explanatory. So there's a chat down the side where you can put your questions to Tom and just have a chat with each other. And I'll keep an eye on that as we go through the conversation. And then there's also the ask a question button, which I think people are finding already, um, which um, will kind of just pop up a notification to me and I'll make sure to weave that in to the conversation as well. Um, so it's lovely to see the chat bubbling away already and so many people on there. That's great. Um, and the only other thing to say is that um, hopefully there won't be any technical issues. I always feel like I'm tempting fate when I say that, but um, hopefully there won't be. But if you do have any problems your end, there's a button which says get audio video help. And if you click that, that will generate a link and hopefully reset things and that will make everything work like magic. <laughs> Is this cat in set? <laughs> cats interviewing cats? It's a little bit kind of, um, yeah, inward looking, but, you know, we've got Tom, so we feel like we should kind of make use of him. <laughs> so perhaps a little bit kind of like inward looking, but all, all to the good, I think. What do you think, Tom? <laughs> I hope so. Let's find out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how the conversation goes. Um, so, yeah, the cats and monkeys, the animal kind of uh, union combining. <laughs> um, so I guess the first thing to say is before we get into kind of um, Spain adventures and kind of why you've kind of arrived at Lancat and what you're here to do. Um, it might be uh, nice to spend a bit of time talking about um, the world outside of financial services and the very different world of e-bikes, which is where you found yourself for a period. Um, yeah. So I, I guess it's just for many people on this call and kind of myself included, like my career has always been in and out of financial services for the most part. And a lot of people on the call will be the same. So what was it kind of like to go one into a completely different world and two having to start understanding the intricacies of electric bikes and scooters yeah no, thank you for asking and um i so i've worked in financial services for 35 years something like that so it was kind of a bit of a thing to to leave that um but um uh and I would encourage, you know, it, it, like, it was a good thing because I'd worked at Hargreaves for about 20 years and it's a really good company and I've really enjoyed working for them. And, uh, you know, it was me, not them. I, I needed a change. I needed a break. I joined a small company. It had turned into a really big company. Um, and uh, I just I just needed to shake things up a little bit. Um, and uh, it just happened that th that was where my head was already at. And I was looking for things to do and I wanted to change things, but I didn't quite know how. I found it kind of hard to let go because I was in a really good job and I was having a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and then my old boss who'd set up the pensions business at Hargreaves, Adam Norris, uh, got in touch um, um, and he, he'd set up this electric bike and electric scooter business. And he wanted someone to do lobbying and PR for him. Um, and that was a really easy choice for me. Um, and I mean, the job didn't work out and the business struggled to make a profit. So I was only there for about nine months. And then he had to let a load of people go, including the chief exec, the marketing director, myself. And I've got no regrets at all about going to do the job. And it got me out of hard grease because I didn't have the courage to do that myself. You know, I could have just left, but I didn't. And so so Adam really did me a favor in getting me out of there. And if the bike business had worked out, that would have been great. And I'd still be there now. Um, and it didn't because it turns out actually making a profit was quite hard. 
the whole world, I mean, re and retailing is pretty hard at that level and the margins are pretty thin and it's really competitive. And that was last summer when we were in lockdown and everybody was cycling and riding scooters. And that was just an amazing time and the business was growing really fast. That was super exciting. Um, and then it kind of stalled a bit towards the end of last year. Um, engaging with the Department for Transport, you know, engaging with different bits of government, that was really interesting. Um, I learned a lot about carbon emissions and the worst thing you can do um, is just replace your electric car every year. Um, the environmental impact of manufacturing an electric car is significantly worse than building an internal combustion oh, really? engine vehicle. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, and we have huge infrastructure problems in this country with, um, you know, making it safe and practical for people to cycle and to use electric scooters. And, and there is no easy fix to that. There's no silver bullet to that. Um, and electric cars are kind of part of the solution and they're better than internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, but actually, if you've got an old internal combustion engine vehicle, the best thing you can do is just keep driving it because because of that manufacturing impact of all the carbon emissions of buying a new car. Buying a new oh, car okay. is a really, really bad thing to do. So if you are going to get a new car, get a second hand car. Don't get a new car um, is one thing. I mean, actually. The best solution in the long term is uh, just everyone should be driving golf buggies, right? Yeah. Because because of the um, <laughs> a, a, a if everyone was driving golf buggies at twenty miles an hour around towns, we would solve so many problems. Uh, really? And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so pedestrian accidents would be a thing of the past. It, um, environmental emissions would be reduced. Uh, yes, yeah, so many so many things would be solved. So electric cars are better than internal combustion engine cars, but they're not actually the, the, the best solution in the long term. And I'll just say a bit about scooters. Um, I mean, they're a bit crazy. I think it was interesting just having been in Spain where a lot of people ride them around Granada. They're good. They, the uh, electric bikes are better. Um, as a car driver, it scares the hell out of me whenever I see an electric scooter rider in front of me because yeah. they are, you know, they're just kind they of, don't oh, like I, speed, really, don't they? <laughs> I, I really, I really don't want to kill you. You know, it's just <laughs> kind of thing. So it always makes me a bit nervous. Um, yeah, Paul, look, I'm, I mean, I have a diesel car sitting on the drive, but it's like 15 years old and I'm just going to keep running it until it dies. And that's okay. Um, and, yeah. and then and then I will probably buy a second hand electric car. But for now, you know, it's actually because, I mean, it puts about 10 to 15 tonnes of CO2 in the atmosphere when you build a new car. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that's years and years of motoring in one hit. So it's all about anyway. That was really good fun, and and I did that uh, last year at the beginning of this year, and then it didn't work out, and the business is kind of sort of it's still running, but it's had to scale down its operations a lot, which is a shame. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm a keen cyclist, and I want to see everyone riding bikes, um, and, and 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 then I went off and did a job for the government, and that was interesting as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean. I guess the sort of uh, upfront disclaimer about all of that is that you went to go and do some work um, around uh, the money and pension service and that the fruits of that labour haven't been published yet. So no, you can't no. kind of do a big reveal about what's in that report. But I guess maybe you could talk about what you were tasked to do and why maybe yeah yeah absolutely and that was really interesting so guy Oppenman asked me to to review as an independent external reviewer to to kick the tires on the money and pension service to look at um its 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 governance its accountability um its efficiency and its efficacy so basically mm -hmm. are they using public money well um okay. and to look at the whole operation to look at um the the services they deliver and just to ask the question like could could you be doing this any better and and you know um that 150 million odd pounds that the the, the, the exchequer is handing over to maps every year what are they doing with it and are we getting good value for money out of yeah that? And that was really interesting project to, to 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 look at um and um i will just make this observation that um i think i think that the the organization and you know it's had a tough time um i was gonna I say people... it's been through quite a lot of change in terms of the different bodies coming together and all of that kind of thing that one of the things that really struck me was um obviously we've all had a lot of challenges over the last 18 months with covid and lockdown and all the rest of it the fact that they were trying to crash together three different organizations um the money advice service the pensions advisory service and pension wise um and they lost their chief exec and they lost two or three other members of the senior executive team in quick succession um, 
And then they had to deal with lockdown as well, and the the overlapping impact, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the impact of having to deal with all of those changes at once was hugely challenging for them, and I think really difficult for any organisation to deal with. Um, and I think uh, I will say that I think that Maps is in a much much better place now than it was a year or so ago, and I, I saw a lot of stuff that gave me a lot of encouragement about how they're moving forwards, and I think. Um, within the constraints of their remit and the resources they've got available, I actually think they're doing a, a pretty good job now in terms of how they're using the public money and what they're delivering with it. So. Okay, cool. Well, I might come back to the whole kind of advice and guidance conversation in a little bit if we've got um, time. <laughs> I like this comment from Ron. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah well we should definitely just, talk just about the fca, give the FCA a, bit, a yeah. little bit of a check yeah we'll come back to that but yeah i'm pretty yeah. sure a lot of people would quite like to see the fca uh, subject to a deep and intensive review but <laughs> so, you know and actually just before you go on i was hmm. uh, so they do a lot of this kind of stuff there are so many arms length bodies of government you know and, and health and safety executive and i mean quite a bit of the nhs is technically an arms length body of government mm -hmm. and and there are actually these independent reviews going on all the time um mm. uh but uh but yes i think ron a lot of people would share your sentiments about the fca so. <laughs> right um before i kind of launch into my kind of domination of the conversation i'm going to take some of the questions we've had in here so <laughs> we have one uh from matthew hi matthew who asks um about fund best buy lists yeah. and your thoughts on those presumably because of your old employer but what is your take on best buy list generally yeah no i'm I, no i do have one and <laughs> i think they are um unnecessary evil i guess is a kind of a, a, a good way to put it i mean i think i know um i remember having this conversation with chris willard a couple of years ago and he was i mean it was interesting to hear him say you know the fca perspective that he was in pretty much the same place that you cannot you cannot expect non-financially literate people. We live in this bubble of financial services and we, we, we look at this stuff every day. Um, most people out there in the real world, most normal people don't. And so if we're going to get them to invest in a pension or in an ISA, um, we could sort of infantilize them and do it all for them. We could just take their money off it and put it in an investment for them and then give it back to them 30 years later. And there's a bit of that going on with auto enrollment and pensions. But actually, we can't just run people's lives for them. We have to have agency and we have to expect people to make their own choices. And we have to give them some help with that. And if we say to people, look, investing in an ISA is a good idea and it will help you build that money tax-free and use an investment ISA rather than a cash ISA if it's over 20 years because you'll get better returns on your money. And they're going to go, well, yeah, but where should I put the money? They do not know. And we have to make it easy for them to make choices. Um, and that's also why I think the FCA is looking at default funds and you know, rolling out default funds more widely on pensions. But So I think Best Buy lists have an important role to play in that. Um, and, and then you have to look at the governance of how those Best Buy lists are put together. And there has to be transparency and effective scrutiny so that you're not getting conflicts of interest and... You can see um, the decision-making criteria that organisations are applying in order to construct that best buy list. So, um, I think I think they should be there. I think they serve a necessary, useful function, um, but we have to do it well. Yeah, I think yeah. Among the criticisms of of best buy list was the kind of issue around it's sort of looking like a recommendation because you're mm. kind of presenting this kind of almost recommended funds and 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 what people had to do to get on that list i suppose yeah and that's where you come back to the kind of transparency and scrutiny and process around how those lists are constructed and what financial incentives are involved and yeah that all has to be um examined and has to be uh, fit for purpose. So um, yeah, I, I agree you, you make a good point there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so somebody asked if you've moved to Scotland, <laughs> which I don't think is the case. <laughs> no, no, I have been up to Scotland a couple of times in the last few weeks. And it was a real treat if I can now treat Edinburgh as my kind of my second city because Edinburgh is a pretty cool place. But It's um, a really no, pretty city, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. No, it's, it's great. Um, it, 
it's a bit dark and cold and wet at times but um uh no I'm still very happily living in uh, just outside bristol uh, and with no plans to move anytime soon so we have um uh billy burrows on here who's given his full name which is lovely <laughs> and he says um if after reviewing maps and um, with your experience at hargreaves what's uh, your honest view about closing the advice gap uh yeah hi billy um so actually i didn't realize it was you i, I saw the william charles thing and i thought oh, i didn't i didn't i, didn't, <laughs> I apologize I didn't if billy is um passe now um i, yeah. I will address him in the future is is mr burrows <laughs> mr burrows yeah so um i think uh the fca kind of i mean the whole um advice guidance review didn't really shift the dial properly um and I think I was really interested in the investment strategy paper they put out a couple of weeks ago where they appeared to be kind of opening the door a little bit to um, providers delivering a little more of a guided sale. Um, and um, I think, what is it, 8% of the population take financial advice typically year to year. Um, uh, and I think... Um, I think you've got professional advisors over here, mostly doing a really good job. And I think the way the advice profession has evolved over the last few years has been a really good thing. And I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to mess with that. Um, I think maps has a really important role to play in giving people information and heuristics and tools and rules of thumb and ways that they can help themselves. And I think, um, the, the bit that got missed in the whole uh, advice review a, a couple of years ago was um, it has to be easier. There has to be more accommodation for firms to give customers a steer within the, within a uh, an umbrella of a clear understanding of where the where the uh, accountability and the responsibility for those decisions lie. So it should be possible for firms to say to Natalie, "Look, Natalie." I'm going to give you some tips and some guidance, but this is your decision and your choice. And I'm just helping you make your decision and your choice. And if any of this makes you uncomfortable, you know, you can go and talk to maps or you can go and pay an advisor. But I think still and for too long, the FCA sought to gold plate everything. And the only advice you can have was perfect advice. Um, and anything less than that had to be just information right down at the other end of the spectrum. Mm. So uh, that's kind of my, 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 my broad take on that. Yeah. So I think, so what does Paul say here? Um, I think we need to educate consumers on financial planning basic. Next, no one understands the five simple steps to follow to approach it. It's not rocket science. So there is a kind of, um, I guess, foundational planning that um, mm. I guess people need to go through to kind of help them. I think John Porteous was talking about that a while back around helping people make that leap into financial planning. Um, but I remember when like I was at Money Marketing and the whole advice versus guidance thing was kind of raging then. And and I think on the one hand, it was like, well, this is a really, this would be a positive thing if guidance works because it helps close the advice gap. Uh, but I think there was then a sense of, Ugh, this is just providers trying to give advice without having a liability for it. So do you feel like the debate has kind of, moved on um a lot since then it, it feels like it has moved on a bit and it feels like you know going back to the farmer review which was what sort of 20 2015 2016 was it from memory um oh gosh yeah yeah no, it's sort of like so, around yeah. it's it it a few years back right yeah um, and then um and it's been quite interesting stepping out of the industry and coming back in and looking at the tone of stuff coming out of the fca now um, and I think that it feels like there might be, and I don't know whether this is actually a deliberate strategic move on their part or whether I'm just kind of making patterns in the snow, whether on patterns in the snow sounds a bit wrong. But anyway, so I'm you know, <laughs> looking for patterns that don't exist. Um, mm -hmm. But I look at that investment strategy paper that talked about firms maybe being having more latitude to steer customers around simple products like you know, basic ISO products. And then I look at things like the consumer duty, um, which feels like um, uh, you know you start to fit those together, and 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 it might be that the FCA is looking at this saying, well, we could allow firms greater attitude, latitude to do stuff if we create the right um, mechanisms to hold them to account for the outcomes. 
from that. Um, and so that might then provide a, an environment where firms could give people a bit more to steer and use best buy lists or um, nudges to customers to, to, to towards particular outcomes um, on the condition that they're on the hook for what those outcomes look like. And we can, you know, we can come after you as manufacturers if, if, if you get it wrong. And, and like I said, I may be looking for patents that don't exist, but that's kind of how it feels. It does feel like there's been a bit of a shift in the FCA. And I know there's different management now there to where it was a few years ago. And I know mm -hmm. Charles Randell's about to step down as well as chairman. So it does feel like things have moved on a bit. Yeah. And I guess there is a bit of an overlap there in terms of the consumer duty piece with with prod as well yeah. and the kind of the sort of the direction of travel around that because that was all around yes you have to sort of understand your target market but that wasn't just about advisors understanding that they need to do client segmentation it was about also providers understanding that wherever your product or service is being distributed to you have to also understand that it's suitable for that end client so there is something going on there in terms of more provider responsibility maybe well i think so and i had a conversation with someone at the fca only a week or so ago and it felt it felt slightly disingenuous because they were saying oh no, no there's nothing to see here you know we've got prod already and this is just really a reminder of you know the consumer duty thing is just a kind of we're just building on prod and i'm thinking well if prod was doing its job as you wanted it to you wouldn't have pushed this stuff out about consumer duty you know there would be no point in doing that so the consumer duty has to be an extension in some material way to what you hoped prod would deliver and, and, and when i read the words in the consumer duty paper it feels to me as if they are saying right you know we are we're actually going to be hold firms more directly accountable for the specific outcomes that their customers achieve and to me that looks like a greater imposition on firms to really dig into the data of what customers are buying your products how they're using those products you know what was the design process you went through did you did you explore what the consumer need was in, in designing that product and then having having gone through that and manufacturing of the product and the distribution of it whether you did it yourselves or someone did it for you to then look at uh yeah no seriously fca disingenuous um could could, could happen um that yeah are you then analyzing how customers are interpreting what you put in what has been put in their hands that you manufactured are they using it in the right way are you tracking their behavior over time um, and it feels to me that if providers aren't and i know a lot of them are um but you need to be quite structured you need to be able to evidence that if you can't have that conversation with the fca in another two years time to say yeah look here is all the data we we, we tracked all this we've stayed on top of it we've monitored it we've modified products where we needed to in light of consumer experience if you can't do that then i think you're you're you're, you're running quite a, a business risk with all of that yeah okay yeah. um so that was um our whistle stop tour of regulation <laughs> um <laughs> andy kind of uh, wants to kind of pivot the conversation slightly and ask a very big question uh, but if you could change one thing in pensions legislation what would it be yeah no good question um I, I tell you what i'm just going to pick up on one thing that i just briefly referenced on on the on the on the default funds mm. um before we move on to the kind of pension okay stuff. Because, cool, well yeah. you know, this kind of this sort of bridges across a bit to pension funds anyway because uh, you, you're drifting into kind of dwp territory here as well um but um this this increasing use of things like igc and consumer duty and default funds um feels like to some degree the fca almost subcontracting regulation um and saying to the marketplace whether it's through igcs or holding firms accountable for the products that are sold on their behalf or saying right well you put in place a default fund and then we'll track you know whether that default fund serves your customers well but the fca has almost looked across the marketplace and said well there is just so much going on here there are so many firms we have to regulate there are so many ifa businesses and product providers and platforms and consumer credit market you know the fca has a huge landscape that's trying to regulate and to manage and it's playing whack-a-mole at times but it's almost like come to the conclusion well the only way we can deal with this is if we push some of that responsibility downstream a bit and then give ourselves the tools to beat people around the head with if they don't then do it in a way that we find satisfactory um 
And actually, I've got a degree of sympathy with them over that because um, they are trying to regulate a massive and complicated marketplace. And I think you know, default, default funds play uh, a role in that as well. On on the on the, on the pension legislation question, um, just one if, thing, yeah, <laughs> just one thing. I would probably go to I'd probably go to tax relief. Okay. Um, I think. I mean, there is obviously there is a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think there's a you know there's a lot we could talk about there. And I think you know the at retirement space, which, by the way, I think is another area where the FCA is going to be back for more in due course. And we've had um, the retirement income market study and the retirement outcomes review, and um, uh, most of the interventions the FCA has made in the retirement space so far has mostly looked at the non-advised distribution and the non-advised purchasing process around retirement income products. But I'm really conscious that that challenge of managing um, a fluctuating DC pot for an indeterminate period of time in retirement is just such a ridiculously difficult challenge. And there are all the various strategies you can use, like 4% or... Um, you know, drawing down capital or just taking the natural yield or whatever. You know, there's there's lots of ways you can skin the cat, um, yeah. but there are lots of ways you can get it wrong as well. And yeah. I, I, you know, I think it's inevitable the FCA is going to be coming back for more and looking at um, scrutinising the way the industry has stepped up and met that challenge that that has been landed in our laps as a result of pension freedom. But back to your question, uh, if I was going to change one thing, I'd say tax relief because it is, I mean, it sucks in such vast amounts of public money, tens of billions of pounds. I think it is a massively ineffective use of public money, certainly in terms of how it acts as an incentive to, to, to save and how it motivates people to save. And no one understands what how tax relief works. Again, not outside our little bubble that we live in anyway. So, um, I'd really like to think it could be used more effectively. And I think auto-enrollment has been a real game changer in that context. You know, if I'm auto-enrolled into my workplace pension and I'm putting in a few percent, my employer is putting in money too. I am not going to not join this pension, right? Mm -hmm. So so why is the government giving me tax relief on top of that? Is it to try and add to the sum value of the total pension savings? I'm not sure that's an efficient use of public money. To me, tax relief is there primarily as a, as a motivator, as an incentive, and as a reward for saving. And given that I am going to do it anyway through also normal through the benefit of the employer contribution, why am I getting that tax relief as well? So given a magic wand, I would get rid of tax relief entirely and come oh, up right, with a, okay. a So much, not even flat rate, just, just get rid of it. Well, no, I get rid of the concept of tax relief, i.e. linking the incentive to my tax rate, because because that also is a bit of a joke. Yeah. Um, it's it's just a massive complication. And yeah, I, I would just have towards people who are already saving or who are already right. well saving. So I yeah. would come up with something that looked more like a lifetime ISA, where there is just okay. a an incentive to save, a top up from the government just to reward you, but I would use that reward far more judiciously. And I would apply it where it have most effect, which is definitely not in places like the auto enrollment space where I'm getting the employer contribution already or on really high earners. And I know they bought in things like the money purchase annual allowance and they cap the annual allowance. They've got lifetime allowance. So there are all these restrictions on the amount of tax relief that I can get. But if I'm a really high earner, I'm still scooping up large buckets of public money as an incentive to save in the form of tax relief. And I don't see that as a particularly efficient use of public money either. So. Mm. Short answer, tax relief. Okay, great. Um, so expanding that out then and maybe staying with the sort of pensions policy side of mm. things for a bit, um, are there sort of issues or changes uh, coming our way that you're kind of watching particularly closely or that people need to be aware of, do you think? Uh, yes. And hit, again, hit I think it's choice it's, of uh, many, I guess. <laughs> it's, 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 it's great fun as you go away and you come back and it's still events, dear boy. There's still just stuff happening all the time. I think yeah. the age 55 to 57 is a really interesting one. Uh, the change in the retirement age, um, which, um, you know, the Treasury seems to have managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory and has come up with a solution that just is going to annoy everybody. And it's just going to make everything worse. So uh, well done, guys. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, I really hope that 
um, someone somewhere is able to have a word in their ear and say, look, you do realize how much more complicated this is going to make it for simpler statements and pension dashboards and preventing fraud. And it's like, you know, if you really wanted to mess the world up, you couldn't have come up with a better way of doing it. So so please think again on that. I mean, we just heard this, this week on the simpler statements. I mean, I think it's good. This, no one objects to the idea of simpler pension statements, but um, I've yet to hear anyone other than Guy Opperman suggest that having a pension statement season is a good idea. Um, yeah. And, you know, this this idea of shoving them all out in one go in the vain hope that it will get people buzzing and talking about pensions, it's just so not going to work. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's kind of interesting. The small pots consolidation piece is a really interesting one, um, which would also be jeopardized by the age 57 rules they've come up with. Um, and, and there's a massive inefficiency in the system that all the small pots building up. So a solution is needed there and work is in train on that. Um, but there's still some hard yards to do on that one. I think it's really interesting. The DWP is looking at the structure of pension charge caps and, and saying that we should, um, we should perhaps just strip it all down to just an annual management charge and get rid of things like fixed fees within the charge cap, yeah. which which makes some sense. But I think that opens up a really interesting conversation around cross subsidies, um, because there are cross subsidies going on all the time. Either I'm, you know, because I've got a big pension pot, I'm cross subsidising the member next to me who's only just joined, or there are intertemporal cross subsidies going on. You know, I'm causing the provider a loss today, but they'll get their money back from me in 10 years' time when I'm still a loyal member and they get their money back. But you can't really unpack charging structures unless you're willing to have a grown-up conversation around what cross subsidies you regard as acceptable to have built into the system. And uh, otherwise, you're always going to get members coming along and saying, hang on, why am I paying more than that guy? Or, you know, I've got a £100,000 pot and you're still taking half a percent off me and that's 500 pounds a year and that seems unfair that guy next to me has only got a 1000 pound pot and you take a few quid off him how's that fair that that kind of stuff so yeah i think i think there's still kind of a lot going on in, in the in the pension space and there's a lot going on in the um in in, in in the you know we've talked about the sca there's still a lot going on in the regulatory space and around the advice guidance uh, territory as well but uh, we'll we'll continue to make life interesting <laughs> as always <laughs> and then yeah. so are there uh, things i mean there's so many sort of routes we can go down here but are there sort of challenges at each stage of the market in terms of the particular challenges that are facing advisors and planners versus the specific challenges facing platforms and then providers or, or are yeah, they all yeah. kind of wrapped up in and around some of the things we've been talking about already yeah, I think they are all. Oh, and look, you know, I'm also going to, just going to pick up. I do. We have to give a special mention to the National Audit Office. I think who who uh, we've seen the announcement today about them uh, going into um, uh, to have a closer look at how the SCA handled the whole kind of British Steel DB transfers piece. And I think that's interesting because um, I and many others were shouting quite loudly, look, there's a car crash happening here. Yeah. Everybody knew bad stuff was happening down in South Wales. And and quite a lot of people, you know, Al Rush and others, were making a Henry Tackle, making a big fuss about it. So there are lessons to be learned from that. And it's yeah. really important that that is being scrutinised externally. Um, and, um, you know, if the FCA has the right powers... Why were they not being used more effectively? If it doesn't have the right powers, how can we make sure the SCA can deal with that more effectively in the future? What was the internal communication like and all that? So I think that's going to be a really interesting one to watch. And I really hope the National Audit Office does a, a really good, solid forensic job in scrutinising what happened there and what we can learn from it. Yeah. So I just I, I just wanted so. to mention that, yeah. Yeah, because I think um I think now if the FCA were here, they would probably say, you know, well, we're doing these kind of roadshows and workshops and we are trying to be um, on like more proactive. But I guess the accusation would be is that you didn't listen to the intelligence that was coming in early enough or you, know, or you shouldn't have had to rely on the industry to report it to you because you that's your job. You should have seen this coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um uh um so yeah no all of that um so um 
as as to what's happening now, I guess I mean, like you know, everybody on this call um, knows their own businesses far better than I do, so I wouldn't presume to kind of sort of tell people what's what. But I, I get the sense from from talking to, to people in the industry, the challenges for advisors around. Um, you know, if you're an independent advisor, that comes that 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 brand comes with quite a cost in terms of staying on top of everything, the technical knowledge you need to 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 continue to be an effective independent financial advisor and i take my hat off to people that do that because i think that's not simple um and i think for advisors more generally coming back to our friends at the fca i think there are going to be further questions asked around um how you're what you're charging for your services and what value of your for money you're giving your customers for that service and um you know if you've got a customer with it or a client sorry with a six-figure portfolio or seven figure portfolio and you're charging a percentage right that quickly gets up into some pretty chunky money you're charging that customer so how are you able to demonstrate you're giving them good value for money um you may well be right so i'm not saying you're not but you know you've got advisors looking after clients with big portfolios who might be getting thousands even tens of thousands of pounds a year income so if that was a fee, if you were getting that customer to actually write out a check for those services, could you justify that money that you're charging them? At the moment, it just kind of happens because you've got you know, charges coming out of the portfolio. I think that's a really interesting one. Um, thank you, Matthew, by the way. Um, yeah. I'm, happy, I'm happy to discuss with you about electric cars uh, <laughs> off, off, offline. Matthew's there um, ready for you to kind of uh, back your kind of next uh, political <laughs> career or boss of the FCA. So we'll all back yeah, you on that one. But yeah. you need to spend some more time at the Lion Cat first, I think. <laughs> and so uh, our fellow cat is asking us, what are you here to do, actually? Uh, uh, so maybe let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, no, and I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, and thinking about my days at Hargreaves, where we had this big internal regulatory team um, and uh, I had worked with a really good bunch of people, but Hargreaves is a big business, FTSE 100 company. So we had a big regulatory team. I was doing some of the PR and some of the policy staff. We had guys in the technical back room, really good people. Um, I think a lot of businesses don't have, they just can't carry that kind of resource in house. So I guess what I'd like to try and help businesses do is a bit of kind of um, policy risk management is to try and help businesses scan the radar of what's happening, whether it's stuff coming out of the DWP or the Treasury or the FCA or Bank of England or whoever, or the DWP Select Committee is launching an inquiry on, on something. Um, there's a lot going on all the time. And I think businesses find it helpful to have someone like the Lancat who can just keep an eye on stuff and help them be on top of uh what disruptions could impact on their businesses and then how they can mitigate those disruptions how we might be able to help them address those challenges and that might then involve picking up the phone to a civil servant and, and talking to them about these these policy interventions that are going on and, and and how we could um how we could help them uh, engage over that policy making process um and i think i think there is uh i think there's a lot of need and demand for those kind of services so that's i mean that's the kind of stuff that interests me so i'm really hoping someone will pay me to do it for them, kind of thing um uh, and i think uh, i'm also really struck by you know having seen hargreaves go up over 20 years um, i think the challenges for businesses around um staying on top of technology um Thank you, Paul. I'll have a look at the uh, I'll have a look at the article afterwards about electric cars, um, <laughs> electric bikes, session, look, electric, <laughs> electric, electric bikes, electric scooters, and electric uh, electric golf buggies are the way to go. Um, I think the technology challenge is really interesting because you get small challenger brands like Hargreaves starting up, or Pension B, which is another great business, it's still relatively new, and you have simple systems and everything works fantastically well. And then the better you are at it, the more successful you are at it, and the bigger you get, the more legacy systems that you uh, you build up that kind of uh, drag behind you. Someone I was on a call with this morning referred to the technology debt, the, the, the phenomenon that exists where you, you kind of do quick fixes and patches to solve short-term problems that then mean a year from now when you need to do other changes, you know, You've got a bit of a burden of work over here that doesn't work quite so well and you have to 
it just adds to the work that you've got to do every time you want to make a change in your business. So I think I think one of the biggest challenges, whether it's for platforms or product providers uh, or for, for advisors, actually, and it's really interesting the way um, the boundaries have got blurred. Uh, I guess they've all, they get blurred at times, but I think technology is driving a further blur in the boundaries. So, so staying on top of that technology and keeping it simple. And you know, I don't pretend to understand how the technology works. Other clever people do that. But staying on top of that and keeping it efficient, I think, is a really big challenge. That leads into customer service challenges because um, uh, the financial services industry is not always very good at dealing with customer engagement quickly and efficiently. And some advisor businesses are fantastic. Hargreaves mostly has been really good at that kind of stuff. Quite often, if you want to get your pension provider to answer a question or you want something to happen or you need a transfer to happen, you could be waiting months, never mind weeks or days. So I think that remains, and that's a technology phenomenon, basically, that, that it comes down to that sometimes the technology is not great. So I think that's a continuously a big challenge right across the place for providers, for platforms, for advisors. And then I am really also interested in the way the boundaries have got blurred. So, you know, advisors can sort of grab a bit of DFM and grab a bit of platform technology, and they can become almost a vertically insulated, integrated one one stop solution for all of their customers' needs. And you get platforms doing distribution. And so there's just car, ah, there's just so much going on. It's all really exciting. Muddling and muddying of the waters, I guess, and, and who's yeah. doing what and offering what service, yeah. Yeah, and, I think it's really and, and we ha and we haven't even talked about the ESG stuff. And we had the Treasury stuff out yesterday on that, and there's yeah. so much more to happen on that, um, and that will continue to be a big disruption. And platforms, by the way, have largely dodged a bullet on that one so far. So I think asset it's managers, ESG, um, yeah, 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 so, or governance, or yeah. So um, in what way are you part of the solution to the ESG uh -huh. challenge? You know, we had a lot of focus on fund managers and on the advisory process and how advisors take account of client wishes and how. Fund managers, you know, you're the ones managing the money. So we're definitely looking at how you're dealing with it and pension schemes. The DWP has been really active on that. So far, there's not been much scrutiny of what platforms are doing to be part of the ESG solutions. I think that's kind of an interesting one to watch. Out okay. Well. Okay. Um, and so just um, briefly, just going back to the British Steel thing, I'll just try and ask one's question here around why will the NAO's kind of review be any different to the work of Frank Field and uh, the Work and Pension Select Committee on on what went wrong with British Steel? Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a short answer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I hope my understanding is that the NAO is looking more closely at the internal processes of what, what the FCA was doing. Um, and I may be doing Frank Field a disservice there, but I'm not sure to what extent he... Look, I'm trying to remember what was in his work. Yeah, um, I yeah, perhaps his focus was more around um, the steel workers themselves. I don't know yeah. if I'm remembering that rightly. Um, but I would really like to see someone going after in a nice way, obviously, um, the individuals <laughs> in the FCA, you know, what, what messages went into the FCA, what was done with those messages, why couldn't they act sooner, what, what stopped them acting sooner, was it a concern about interfering in a marketplace where they felt they didn't have the right powers? You know, those are the kind of questions I would like to see answered. Um, and I don't feel like they have been adequately so far. Okay, okay. Um, and then now for something completely different. <laughs> Let's talk about what you did at the weekend because we were just chatting <laughs> beforehand and I just went into central London and pootled around for a bit and you um, scaled um, mountains and uh, all sorts in there. Uh, in Spain, yeah, so, and um, so tell me why you were there and, and what that was all about. Um, so this is just like a bunch of middle-aged blokes going off to have fun for the weekend at one level. It was a charity fundraising thing for a really good charity called the Youth Adventure Trust. And I know people on this call have donated to it, so thank you very much for that. But it was it was pretty cool. So we cycled up to uh, – we ended up on top of Mulhassen, which is the highest mountain in mainland Spain. It's about 3,500 metres high, and we – we bivvied up there without tents, you know, so we're just in sleeping bags and bivvy bags out under the stars at 3,000 metres. It was really cold. You know, so like we we kind of knew it was going to be, and we had all the right kits, so it was fine, but it was pretty cold. Um, and it was just really cool being able to mountain bike up there. They've got trails up there you can ride. Um, and that was that was really great fun. Um, so we cycled all the way up there from Granada, which took a while. Um, uh, and... Um, 
and then we stayed up there and we sort of mucked around a bit and went up Malhas and, and then and then and then the really fun bit was cycling from Pico de Valletta, which is about three thousand two hundred meters up, all the way back down to Granada, which is only about five hundred meters above sea level. So we started off; it was freezing, literally freezing at the top. We set off. We were cycling down the mountain with all our gear on, and by the time we got down to the bottom, we were stripping all the clothes off, and we were in twenty-five degree heat, and it was fantastic. So yeah, you're right, John. You did say it was going to be cold, and it really was cold, and we had all the right kits. So <laughs> it was fine. We had a fox came into our camp in the middle of the night. I woke up, and there's this fox standing over my head, like looking around all the food. So it was pretty cool. So uh, it was great fun, and it was all for charity. And we raised a pretty, we have raised a pretty good sum of money for the Youth Adventure Trust. Um, but if anybody else wants to put any more money in, that's great. Too, so thank you. Cool. Well, I'll um, on that. Oh, note, thank, thank you for the link. There you go. There's the link that someone's just posted. Um, so. But do you want to maybe um, explain um, who the Youth Adventure Trust are and, and, and your connection with it and, and, and some of the work they do? Yep. So I'm a trustee of the charity. Um, so they take disadvantaged children aged uh, 11 to 14. They put them through a structured three year, three year program these these are kids who've got like, parents have been in jail you know anyone with really serious problems or been bullied at school or just you know confidence issues or i mean some and they're all really good kids and they've got um but but they need some help and just and a lot of them have never been away from home um and uh we take them through a series of outdoor camps up in the mountains forest camp mount uh, um uh, uh um coastal camp uh, over three years we do a lot of work with them on, on sort of building self-esteem and teamwork and confidence and resilience um and and at the end of it just kind of send them out and there's a whole mentoring scheme that goes on afterwards and they come out of that better able to lead more fulfilling lives um and it's just a fantastic thing and i went i've been a volunteer on the camps and it really is just brilliant to to see the, the transformation that can happen in the children over the three years that we work with them. But it's all it's all, it's all all funded by donations. Um, the charity's got about a million pound a year turnover. I'm a trustee of the charity um, and it's just really great work. So uh, it was really nice to, to, to raise some money for it as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so that has absolutely flown by. So thank you to everyone uh, for like, fielding all your questions and, and making the conversation so lively. That's been brilliant. Um, so thank you, Tom, as well, for giving up your time. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, and so the only other thing I wanted to say really was that we're just um, not uh, hosting home games next week, only because there's a small matter of the budget happening and we couldn't quite compete with that. So we're going to take a week off and then we'll be back um, early November with another round of brilliant guests so thanks so much for joining us thank you tom again lovely to see you as always thank you everybody and chat to you all soon cheers bye, bye.